All right, so uh, is the screen visible for everyone? Yes, sir. All right, okay, great. Okay, so last time we were talking about temperature, really, and uh, what did we do? We derived the equation for kinetic energy in terms of temperature, uh, where we saw that the temperature uh, is really the measure of the speed of the vibrations or uh, of molecules really, right? It, so the more the temperature, that means the more faster uh, the molecules are jiggling around in any given substance. Uh, and then we talked about what that temperature really is. Uh, we talked about fields, what are fields and the idea of fields in mathematics and then how we can use that idea of fields in and apply it to physics. And then we talked uh, that uh, really uh, for us, it's enough to know that a field is, uh, is something where you can assign a value at every point in space. And that's something it's called a field. Uh, where, uh, and then we talked about temperature field would be that you can assign a value of temperature at every point in space. And that's a temperature field. And uh, then we were talking about, uh, really, I think we were talking about the equilibriums uh, or the equilibrium state of any two systems or more than two systems as well. So is there any question from that uh, lecture from anyone? No question? No, sir. All right. Okay, so if there are no questions, then, uh, okay, so we were talking uh, about this thing. Let's suppose that I have a body, A1, uh, sorry, A, and another body, B. Suppose they are at two different temperatures, T1 and T2. Now, what would happen if I bring these two bodies in contact with each other? At this point, they're two separate bodies. They, they're not, they're completely isolated. What that means is that there's no uh, interaction between A and B at this point, but at this point they're now interacting. Uh, and I bring these two bodies close together so that they can interact or really they're touching each other right now. What would you expect in terms of temperature to happen in this case? Suppose, I'm gonna give you an example. Suppose that this one, uh, A is hot and this one is, relatively colder, right? So you can say the T1 is greater than T2. So what happens if I bring these two bodies together? Uh, what would happen in terms of temperature? Anyone, any guesses, whether they're wrong, it doesn't matter, but any guess, any prediction? Uh, the temperature of B increases and I mean, overall, it's like diffusion. Yeah, exactly, right? So. What would not happen is that T1 plus T2 is some new temperature. That's not going to happen, right? Because you don't add, temperatures are not added in this way when you bring them together, right? So this is something that will not happen. What would happen is that some quantity, which is called heat, I'm not defining heat at this point, but that some particular quantity would flow from this body B to A. And that's heat, it's energy, it's really energy. And that energy is known as the heat, heat energy, for example, right? You can give it a name, heat energy. Heat flows from B to A, sorry, my bad. T to B was cold, right? It would flow the other way around. It would flow from A to B, right? Because a is hot. Now, there is no such thing as cold is not independent from hot. Cold is just a result of less amount of heat present. So the only thing that really exists is heat. And only heat flows, right? So if I remove some of the heat from A, then A would start to feel slightly cold. And what would happen is that this heat from A would transfer to B 
and it would keep transferring to B unless both A and B temperatures are equal. And when they, these two temperatures are equal, the flow of heat is going to stop. It's going to come to a halt, right? And that is known as equilibrium state or equilibrium temperature. So is that concept clear? Uh, is the idea of heat and uh, what temperature really is, is that clear? Yes. Okay, it's clear. All right. Okay, so the key point is, let me write it over here. The key point is uh, heat flows, right? Heat flows. And that's just the key word that you have to remember that there is no such thing, uh, nothing other than heat. There's no really opposite of heat and it's just heat. And if it flows out of some body, then that body becomes cold. And if the heat flows in some body, then that body becomes hot, right? So that's more or less it. So for example, if you have a room inside a room, I just gave you a small example. Uh, this is a room and suppose the room is hot, right? And there is a bottle of, it's a very silly example, but there's a bottle of cold water, right? And this uh, bottle is of cold water. Suppose, so why is it cold in the first place? Because when you put it in freezer or fridge, the heat flows from this bottle outward right? It flows out of this bottle. And now if I put this in a room, which is hot, what would happen is that this, the, hot, the heat from this room would flow towards this bottle. All the heat would flow towards this bottle and the bottle starts getting warmer. And in turn, the room starts getting a bit cooler. And the flow of heat stops when the temperature of the room is exactly equal to the temperature of this bottle. So I'll just say T subscript B. And then that's when the heat flow of heat will stop. All right, so is, that, uh, the, is this idea completely clear for everyone? Yes. Okay, all right, okay, good. So now let's talk we, we have talked about temperature. We have a, somewhat of an understanding of what temperature is now. But now let's say that, how do I measure this temperature? We have already said that it's okay. It's, it's a number at every point in space. How do I measure this number? So we have to talk about measurement of temperatures, right? Okay. So, we have different tools for that. And we can use different properties of uh, substances to measure temperature. So for example, one of the things is that suppose I have a liquid, right? We know that when you heat liquid, uh, of course, now we will just talk uh, for some specific liquid, water behaves very differently compared to other forms of uh, other types of liquids, right? But in general, mostly what happens is when I heat a liquid, so in liquid, the atoms are slightly apart from each other, slightly, and not too further apart. And when I heat this thing, they start vibrating, right? They start jiggling around and they start occupying more space. Right? Because when I give it more temperature, we already established that giving more temperature means making the atoms or molecules vibrate faster. If that happens, then, uh, then what would happen? Then the, these molecules would start occupying slightly more space. 
right? And as I keep on increasing the temperature, they'll start, or suppose I don't keep on increasing, but at some temperature, they'll start expanding. And so the final result could be something like this, right? So now they're like this. Uh, this is not an exact picture. So I hope it's not confusing, but what I'm trying to tell you is it would expand, right? And the expansion is obvious because I'm heating the liquid and the molecules start getting up further and further apart from each other. And that's why it's expanding. Now you can use this property to measure temperature. And that's a liquid expansion technique, right? So you would need a liquid whose boiling and melting points are known. Now boiling or melting or freezing point is, uh, the name says it all, it's, the, it's that value of temperature where something starts to boil and boil is just, it starts turning, it ch really changes its phase. It's, its state is changed from liquid to gas, right? Now, uh, there are other forms of measuring temperatures as well. Uh, another one is uh, you see some, I'll use the word EMF, and I be, hope that you're all familiar with this thing. It's like a potential difference. And if that potential difference is produced across uh, two junctions, right? And this is something that it's called a thermocouple. Uh, thermocouple. And now I'll talk in detail about this thermocouple. Uh, how will I use this to measure the temperature of, well, any substance, right? Uh, this is, this thermocouple is a thermometer, really. And it's, it's an electrical thermometer. And so I'll now try to draw a diagram for this thing. So suppose it's something like this. Now here is where you measure this potential difference or that EMF that is produced. And there are two junctions really. Now this is, suppose this is some junction one, I'll call it J1. This is some junction J2, right? And there's a wire, something like this. Now, it is, uh, this, uh, this line is uh, actually a copper wire. Now it needs not to be copper uh, wire uh, always. This one, this one, this, which is the iron wire. Uh, these wires can be of any metal. We don't care if it's a really good conductor or it's slightly poorer conductor compared to other, but it has to be metal. It has to be a conductor. Because how, the, how will we measure the temperature is if I place this J2 junction, uh, or let's say that this J2 junction is maintained at a constant temperature. I just keep fix the temperature for this thing. And whatever I want to measure the temperature of, I put this J1 in that material, right? So for example, this J1 is put into this material. Now, what happens is uh, these two junctions, because they would be at different temperatures, right? So for example, suppose this is some temperature, let's just say it is fixed at zero. And suppose there, here we have some temperature, uh, could be anything, we'll just take it 10 uh, degrees or whatever, right? Now, there is a difference in these two values, right? Now that difference produces a voltage, which is known as, which is the potential difference or the EMF in this voltmeter. When that happens, when the EMF is produced, it is measured by this uh, voltmeter really. And if the temperature is going to increase, then the temperature difference will increase, right? So for example, if this uh, increases from 10 to 15, then 15 minus zero is five, uh, sorry, 15 minus zero is 15, and the difference has increased. Now, when, when that happens, uh, it gives a rise to some potential difference. And so if the temperature is going to increase, the voltmeter reading is going to increase 
as well right and that's how you can measure the temperature difference by using a thermo uh, by using a thermo thermocouple right and it's uh, it's an electrical thermometer so are you following along is it clear or uh, if, if you have any questions at this point uh, feel free to ask me right can you explain um, this or, again yeah yeah yes now what causes there to be a potential difference oh uh it's the change in uh this temperatures right so it's exactly in the same way if you are familiar with circuits uh when there is a when there is this thing you can say there is a difference in two potentials right we always in physics we care about the difference in potentials we are never concerned with the potential at some particular point because we want its potential is really a relative quantity right in the same way this temperature difference acts behaves as a potential difference and there is a whole branch uh, of this thing where you can use the electrical resistors model to model temperatures as well right in that if you remember um if you remember the series and parallel circuits right series and parallel circuits uh, you can model temperatures using these two circuits as well right so you can model so for example here we have t1 and then here you have something at t2 these temperatures can be added in series as t1 plus t2 and suppose the uh, these temperature difference are uh, you can say that these two uh, the objects are parallel you can then use the parallel model to say that 1 over the final t is 1 over t1 plus 1 over t2 uh, but we'll not get into details of that uh, but you can use this electrical resistors model to model temperatures as well and in the same exact way uh, this potential difference really which is the temperature difference produces this uh, emf or voltage in this voltmeter so whenever there will be some difference in potential you will observe the needle on this voltmeter to move right it would give you some value if suppose that these two junctions were at the same temperature suppose that this is at 10 and this one was also at 10 then no potential difference will be measured because there is no difference right 10 minus 10 is zero there is no difference the difference vanishes and so the voltmeter would not give you any reading so do you understand how if i have a potential difference i can measure that there is some change in temperature between these two uh, junctions where one of the junctions is remain at some constant temperature which we use to make a relative measurement so relative to j2 j the junction j1 has this temperature right so in that way you can tell what would be the temperature right would it be 10 degrees 15 degrees or whatever right so for example if you know if you know the temperature at j2 then all you have to do uh, when you get the reading on this voltmeter, you just, the difference, you'll get the difference. So I'll use TD and that would be T at J1 minus T at J2. This you would get the reading from the voltmeter. T at J1 is unknown. You have to find that. And T at J2 is a known temperature, right? So this is also known. Then the only unknown is this thing and you'll rearrange the equation and you'll find the temperature at junction one. Uh, is that clear? Yes. Sir, does this have anything to do with the average kinetic energy of the particle? I mean, it does, right? It, it's related to the temperature. Uh, of the course, does. of course it does. Because, it, yeah, 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 exactly, right? Because you're talking about temperatures and so, yeah. All right, so a uh, clear for everyone. Hello. 
Okay, I'll assume that this yeah. is clear for everyone. Okay. All right. Now uh, let's talk about quickly. Let's talk about the temperature scales, right? And we we'll talk about the uh, thermodynamic temperature scale, or it's also known as thermodynamic, or uh, it's named after a scientist or, and this is also a unit that we use to write down the temperature, it's Kelvin, right? Kelvin temperature scale. And all we, we have written all our laws of physics in terms of a Kelvin temperature scale, right? So that's why we usually convert from degrees Celsius to Kelvin whenever we are going to use an equation. Right. So, for example, if you want to find out the kinetic energy of the particles, three by two kT, which we have found out, you'll use this thing as Kelvin, right? The temperature as Kelvin. Now, uh, to make a temperature scale, you need two points, right? And those two points are uh, the boiling point. And what is the other point? Any uh, melting point, right? So having these two points, I can define a temperature scale. How does that work? For example, suppose you use water. Now, we know that the melting point of water is the lower point and it's zero degrees Celsius. The boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. Having these two known quantities, I can define the scale now with 100 units. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, and up to so on, up to 100. And dividing these two points, zero to 100, in equal parts, which in this case would be 100 equal parts, I can define a temperature scale, right? Uh, so now we, we can define this temperature scale in terms of uh, Kelvin's as well. And I'm, I hope you all know uh, how do you convert from degrees to Kelvin's and then get from, or from Kelvin's to degrees Celsius, right? Uh, there is this relation, which is known as uh, temperature in Kelvin is equal to temperature in degrees centigrade or Celsius uh, plus 273, I think that is 273 point something, 273 point, I think it's 15. Now, if I have any temperature in degrees Celsius, I add this thing to that and I can go into Kelvin units. Kelvin units. Okay, there, there are two more, uh, two things that you should also know, uh, and those are absolute zero. Absolute zero. Anyone has any idea of what is absolute zero in terms of temperature? Or you can talk in terms of energy as well. Any idea? Okay, I think uh, not. So, okay, so this absolute zero is really a temperature, right? It's a temperature and it's that temperature where you cannot remove any more energy from the system, right? So no more heat can be removed, can be removed, which means that you have removed all of the possible heat from the system and now no more heat can further be removed. So it is the coldest possible system that you can have, which is at absolute zero. So all the energy which was, which was allowed to be removed from the system has been removed. Now no further, you cannot remove any more energy. And 
there is something called internal energy. We'll talk about that in uh, uh, um, as we move forward. Uh, but at this point, even the internal energy is now minimum in the system. You have to remember something that this does not mean does not mean that the energy is zero. This does not mean that the energy is zero of the system. There is going to be some energy. In fact, energy can never be zero, right? Zero energy does not exist anywhere in the universe. And uh, a, a very nice example would be, even if you look at space, where suppose that this is the space and let's just draw some grids over here. Now this is your space and there is nothing in this space. It's completely vacuumed. There's no, no body, no stars, literally nothing, no gas, no air, nothing. Even at that point, there is some energy in this space. Energy is not zero. And I would love to go into the details of why that is. Uh, it's really interesting and all, but I think it would be off topic. If you want to know somewhat, you can just tell me, I'll uh, explain. But sometimes I think I get too carried away with some of the things and uh, then we are we lag behind in our... But anyways, so again, I'm going off topic. But so... It does not mean absolute zero. So the point was that absolute zero does not imply zero energy, right? It does not imply that there is zero energy. Only absolute zero implies minimum energy, which is not equal to zero. All right. However, we still use a model where we say that the energy is zero. Can anyone tell me what model is that? Anyone? We use a model of a gas where the energy is zero. We say that the energy is zero. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, but it's uh, not really. Uh, how can you model a gas? Uh, we can say we have, it's actually, we have been discussing uh, that model since we started the chapter. The biggest hint that I could give. It's an ideal gas, right? So when we say that the gas is ideal, that's what we mean, right? We mean that there is, it has zero energy and it has zero pressure, right? So zero energy model is the ideal gas model. Right, which follows uh, this equation PV is equal to NRT, the equation of state for ideal gas. So the point here is that why do we say that this is an ideal model, ideal gas model? This ideal implies zero energy. Or what that means is that uh, it can have, or it is at uh, zero kelvins, which is minus 273.15 times 10 to the 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 so that's what it means when you say that I have an ideal gas model. So that's absolute zero. Now, the next thing that I want to tell you about is it's quite small and it's also it's known as the triple point. And we'll talk for in terms of water. Anyone has an, any idea what is a triple point? What do I mean when I say triple point of any substance of any liquid, for example? Okay, so no one, any guess? 
um is it that point where uh where a substance is in all three yeah that's that's a very good guess so you can get, get that from the triple right in the sentence triple point of water so it's actually uh, it's it's a temperature it's a temperature and at this temperature uh it, for water it exists in all three states or you can say equilibrium states so it exists as an equilibrium in all of the three states which are vapor uh liquid and what would be the other one is solid right of course at this specific temperature which is the triple point and i'll give you the temperature as well this temperature is uh, t is equal to it's so close to zero that it's 0.01 degrees centigrade which would be 273.1 if it's 5 then here i'll have 16 right uh, uh, kelvins at this temperature water exists as all of these three states right and that uh, that is astonishing right it's water is existing in all of these three states uh in equilibrium right all right so is this clear yes any questions uh, up until this point from anything that we have been doing so far Uh, no. is this thing for every liquid from a sieve uh well you can have a triple point for liquids right uh, this one is specifically for water uh this one this one is specifically for water but you can have a uh, for a different or uh, for multiple uh, liquids right it would they would have their own unique uh triple point from omar uh, sir please explain triple point again all right okay so triple point of any substance of any liquid is that particular temperature at which the substance is going to exist in all of the three states vapor liquid and solid at a time right and it will be in an equilibrium which is even more astonishing right so it exists in equilibrium in all of these three states at that time and this triple point for water is this temperature 0.01 degree centigrade so when the water is at this specific temperature water is going to exist in all of the three states so you would see water as ice cube there would be some liquid layer on this and you would also see some gas uh coming out of this cube so that's a, that's a picture that i can put in your head what it means by uh, 0.01 degrees celsius right and you must have seen this happening in your lifetime as well right if you have seen an a cube of ice you must have seen this thing happening all right so umar is it clear okay good all right so we we have less than a minute remaining i think we'll continue well, the next thing is we'll start with the thermal properties of materials right so things like specific heat capacity latent heat and uh, so on we'll also talk about internal energy and then we'll be really done with the topic we'll, uh, we have we have to also talk about these different types of processes isothermal isobaric uh and uh, adiabatic and so on right so we'll talk about those uh, things hopefully in the next class we will try to finish uh, this chapter right uh is there any uh, any